the title of what we're going to talk about tonight and next week as well is things that make you go, hmm, why most Christians continue to do things that don't make sense and produce little results. Now, these are, I'm, I'm not Chris the Bible teacher tonight. I'm not Chris the politically correct leader tonight. I'm Chris Big Brother. So I'm just going to talk and share kind of raw dog. If you're, please don't be offended. My heart is in the right place, and I want you to just think about these things because as someone who's been in my position for many years, uh, I had someone over my house recently, I had forgotten about this, who talked about how we were doing a Bible study in the early 90s around, my, around a glass table, and the person said, wow, you still have that glass table? And I was like, yeah, we still have it. So I want to share some observations because I believe that if you're going to come here, if you're going to do anything, you want to see results. And we don't want to, religion is when you just do activities for activity's sake. But Christians, as Christians, we're called to bear fruits worthy of repentance. And um, so we should always be examining the fruit of what we're doing. And And I want to make sure that it's not always tangible fruit. There's also intangible fruit. There's character development. There's the ability to grieve things more quickly than you did. There's the ability to forgive people more quickly than you may have uh, done in the past. So there's lots of things that can happen under the surface, but it's still fruit. You've heard me say, you know anything about the Asian, the Malaysian bamboo tree. Uh, it, when, you, when it's planted for the first five years, it doesn't grow at all. And then the last couple of days, it can grow like 12 to 16 to 18 inches a day, and it can reach 90 feet. So my, question, my favorite question for everybody is, when did the bamboo tree start growing? Was it the last 30 days, or was it the day it was planted in the ground? The answer, obviously, was the day it was planted in the ground, but most people could only see the results of it towards the end. So you want to look at your life like that. Turn with me, if you would, to Matthew chapter 5. As I get older, as I've worked with so many people, as I've seen my own life, you know, really, I'm after one thing and one thing alone, and that's lives that are transformed. That's what drives my waking conscience, helping people be transformed by the word of God and becoming all, not part of what he's called them to be. But in order to do that, you, you, you can't... Um, you have to be a critical thinker. You have to examine yourself, so to speak. 2 Corinthians 13.5 talks about examine yourself. Lamentations 3.40 talks about searching yourself and examining. Psalm 139, David said, search me, Lord. There's got to be a degree of introspection. You've got to analyze mindsets, mental paradigms, things that you're hearing. Does, does it even make sense? Um, because a lot of times people are doing things out of fear or misinformation, and that stuff irks me, and it can be real subtle. Sometimes it's manipulative, but you have to really, you have to really um, be a critical thinker, and I want to challenge you not to even, don't take anything you hear from me without examining it. It goes across the board. Anyone who's capable of pro- conveying truth is capable of conveying error. That's probably a good place to start. Anybody who's capable of conveying truth is capable of conveying error. And, you know, Matthew, stay at Matthew 5, but in Matthew 13, you know the reference. It says, enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. But narrow is the gate and difficult is the way that leads to life. And there are few who find it. Matthew 7 verses 13 and 14. So look at the contrast. There's a narrow gate and then there's a wide gate. There's a difficult way and then there's a broad way. You've heard me teach on this before. There's one that has few companions, one that has many. And there's one that leads to life and another that leads to death. Turn there for a second. We'll start there instead. This is going to be very informal. Matthew 7 verse 13. Matthew 7 verse 13 Because you've got to challenge yourself, what path are you on? What path are you on? Matthew 7, verse 13, one more time. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to what? Destruction. 
and there are many who go in by it because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, Zoe, the God kind of life, and there are few who find it. So if you're taking notes, draw two columns, uh, two columns that contrast four different things. There's a narrow gate and there's a wide gate. So you want to ask yourself, am I, am I, as I move forward, am I entering through a narrow gate or a wide gate? The wide gate is the gate that everybody's running through, but it's not seeing any transformation. Mm -hmm. The narrow gate is the way of consecration. It's the way of renewing of the mind. It's the way of quiet time. It's the way of staying in community. It's the way of serving. It's the way of sowing. There's, but there's not that many people in it. There's a difficult way and a broad way. It's easy to be noncommittal. It's easy to just be a schmo, a Sunday morning only. But it's difficult to, to, to be involved in midweek services. It's difficult to serve at your church. So you want to ask yourself, or more difficult, so you want to ask yourself, are you taking the difficult way or the broad way? There's one that has few companions. If you feel like perhaps the curriculum that God has you on seems so unique, it's because you're, you're, you're going through the narrow gate that's going to lead to life. If you want to go through the wide gate that doesn't produce any results, that doesn't make you a threat to the enemy, that doesn't make your life leave a mark that can't be erased, then there's a wide gate. There's an easy way. There's a route that has lots of companions, but you have to choose for yourself. And there's one that leads to life where you know Zoe, the God kind of life, where you sense his fingerprints on, on what you're doing, where there's a tangibility to it. And there's one that leads to death. You want to make sure as you progress that it's my hope that my life leaves a fragrance. If you're around my folks, you know that there's something different about them. So we're talking about, I'm talking about things that make you go hmm. Why Christians continue to do things that don't make sense and produce little results. Matthew 5 verse 21. I got to get rolling. Matthew 5 verse 21. Even Jesus warned against this. Now, I'm going to read super fast, but I want to highlight two phrases. Phrase number one, if it's your Bible and you can highlight it, I want you to highlight the words, you have heard. The second phrase I want you to highlight, if it's your Bible, but I say. Why? Because you hear a lot of things in Christianity but is it what Jesus is telling you to do? Here we go. I'm going to go fast. Verse 21. You have heard, underline it, that it said to those of old that you shall not murder and whoever murders will be in a danger of judgment. Here we go. But I say. See, you hear a lot of things, but Jesus, it may not necessarily be what Jesus is saying. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without cause shall be in danger of judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the, uh, of the council. But whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and uh, bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Agree with your adversary quickly while... You are on the way with him, lest your adversary deliver you to the judge and judge and the judge hand you over to the officer and you be thrown into prison. Assuredly, I say to you, you will by no means get out of there till you have paid the last penny. Now, I read that because time doesn't allow me to read this whole text, but I'm going to highlight two phrases that keep being repeated throughout because he's contrasting what you what you hear. But he's saying, but this is what I say. This is my perspective. Because most people are doing what they hear. It doesn't make any sense, and it's producing little results. So we see in verse 21 of it, your Bible, on the line, you have heard, verse 22, but I say. Drop down to verse 27. You have heard, verse 28, but I say to you. Drop down to verse 33. You read this on your own. Again, you have heard, verse 34, but I say, drop down to verse 38. You have heard, but I say, drop down to 43. You have heard, but I say, 
Now turn to chapter 6, verse 8. After this whole discourse, look at what Jesus says. This is powerful. Chapter 6, verse 8. He says, therefore, do, do not be like them. Remember the post text, the pretext and the post text gives you the context. So I'm challenging you because people hear a lot of things. I hear a lot of things. If you, I don't mean any disrespect, but if you just watch Christian TV all day long, the outcome would be sheer confusion. Because one person is telling you if you don't tithe, you're cursed. Then another person is telling you that Galatians 3.13 says Christ has redeemed you from the curse of the law. Then another person is telling you that Numbers 23 says Balaam, Balaam, couldn't, uh, Balaam couldn't curse him because how can you curse what God is blessed? Wow. So you, you have heard, but you've got to make sure you know what Jesus said. 